Right, I want to talk about something else now, okay? We're going to talk about the issues I've got with, uh, with Hard Surviving 4. I have made a list of changes I would like to see to Hard Surviving 4. Guys, listen to me here. I do not develop this game. I have never worked for Paradox. I've worked with Paradox to do their promotional stuff for certain videos or expansions, but I've never worked for them. I'm not an employee and I never have been an employee, okay? So the information I'm about to give, if you are a developer of Hearts of Iron 4, that's awesome you're listening. But the truth is, I understand I'm not a developer, so therefore the information I'll be saying may be things that are already planned, or two, are things that aren't possible with the game engine. There are limitations. So this list that I've created is a bunch of changes I would like to see to the game to make me enjoy the experience more and play it more. And potentially, hopefully other people do the same. So one of the big issues is capital ships. You want to make capital ships because these are freaking big ships and they're fun to play with. But one of the reasons why capital ships don't really work in Hearts of Iron 4 is they just take way too long to repair and refit way too long and at the end of the day it's just easier to make lots of screening ships like cruisers or destroyers or submarines because you could make them in mass and if you lose one of them doesn't matter because it was a large smaller production that was lost they don't have to worry about it and if they get damaged and they get repaired they'll get repaired and put into battle straight away relatively quickly you don't have to wait around now capital ships on the other hand when they get damaged because they've got so much hp they spend forever in dockyards getting repaired. Listen to me. I know historically ships were knocked out for months on end if they took a lot of damage. But what I'm trying to say is it does not make a very fun game experience. We have to bridge the gap between fun gameplay, computer game, and historical game, by the way. We have to bridge the gap between two of these things. Now, right now, it's very historical game, by the way. Heavy ships spend a very long time refitting and repairing if they take damage. If you spam smaller ships, you can damage these big ships, may not necessarily kill them, but knock them out of service for a long period of time. Here's my solution. To make capital ships more palatable, construction tech will also speed up repairs as well as refitting speed by 10%. 10% for construction one, 10% for construction two, etc., etc. So total of an extra 50% extra repair speed and an extra 50% refitting speed. That way we can make capital ships way more palatable to the general audience. Don't get me wrong, I get the historical context. I know that battleships and, and carriers, uh, well, not, not, not so much carriers, were kind of like uh, being phased out as this idea of a big flagship. But remember, we're playing in World War II right now. We're trying to maximize the amount of fun by staying relatively historical. Historical, gameplay, fun. It's a computer game. It's not real life. So that's my suggestion. I wouldn't recommend an extra construction tech because right now, the naval tree right now is bag full of techs. And I wouldn't want to add an extra one on here that complicates it even more by having extra tech path. Because the truth is... A lot of people never even come into here because they're like, I'm just going to make submarines. And I can't blame them because this is overly complex and it takes up too much research time. It's the same reason not many people touch these down there. Did you even know these were down here? No, because a lot of the time people don't even bother. Did you know these Kermat Special Forces techs were down here? No, because I, I barely even touched them either. It doesn't make it a freebie, by the way. If, like, say, you increase production speed by times three or something like that, something ridiculous like that, I understand at that point it's become so OP that it's like it takes away the complete historical context of capital ships needing long repair times. All I'm suggesting is we just make it slightly more palatable to the player, and we could do that just by having that little bonus. So I wasn't suggesting you should build capital ships a bit quicker. I was just suggesting you can refit them quicker and you can repair them quicker just to make them more palatable. Anyway, that was the first suggestion. Anyway, what's my next suggestion? This is gonna make you guys really salty. Are you ready for this? This is my suggestion. What I wanted to focus on is these spies. What we initially discovered with them is that they were a bit underwhelming when they added them in the resistance. They buffed them and they also kind of a little bit nerfed them as well. <laughs> they nerfed them and then boost them. Like collaboration states right now are really strong. Building spy networks is really strong because you have the ability to reduce, like look at those modifiers there, like invasion defense, naval invasion defense, planning speed, reduce max planning by 100% if you max the plan uh, area out. So this is my suggestion, okay? We buff spies. And how do we buff spies, you say? We have two options for spies. Spies have the ability to lower autonomy. 
So it can be one of their missions. It could be a propaganda. Yeah, so spies have more flexibility. So you can do more with them. You really, sometimes it feels like you're really strangled with what you, you've got the ability to do. And, and sometimes you just want to do things. Because why do you have to use spies only in your own nation or your enemy's nation? Um, why can't you use them in your puppet's nation? So why can't you use like propaganda mission to lower autonomy for like say Lapland? And I could lower their autonomy down to slow it could go. That's just a suggestion out of the blue. It's not a biggie, but it's just something. Anyway, it's time for the biggie now. If a nation is classed as a minor power and you manage to drop their stability below 50%, you know, like you could do a coup. Are you with me, guys? Are you still got my attention? Listen, you have the ability to do an operation where you can puppet them. It's an operation that you can puppet them. Don't get me wrong. It's going to be like a collaboration state. It's going to be expensive. You can only do it if you're a major and they're a minor. So there's none of this bullshit where a major power will puppet a major power. But the beauty of this, guys, the beauty of this, the icing on the cake is with this ability, you can actually get involved in diplomacy around the world. Yes, yeah, same ideology, whatever. Make it really difficult. So it's not an easy thing to do. You can get involved in other people's ideology around the world diplomatically. You're not doing it through conquest anymore. I know the game's all about war. Don't get me wrong. I understand that. But with this ability, you have the ability to diplomatically annex someone. I know initially you're basically just going to puppet them and it'll be a shit puppet to it. It'll just be a standard puppet like this one. But with this ability, then you can start lowering their autonomy through spies and then eventually annex them. Now, you're probably thinking this is in ridiculously OP and I agree, it probably needs a lot of balancing. Same ideology. Maybe it has to be on the same continent as you. Maybe their stability has to be really low as well. Maybe it has to be a percentage of their ideology has to match yours. Something along those lines. And then when you pull off the operation, it has to be ridiculously expensive. It has to cost a lot of civilian factories. It basically just means it has to it has a lot of big a big requirement. And then when you pulled off that big requirement, you get the reward of being able to puppet a nation who is a minor power. And of course, I can hear you say this. Of course, you can turn it off in multiplayer because it's ridiculously OP. But the, but the beauty of this guy is not only can you do dil diplomatic uh, conquest, but top that off spies now feel really useful you can actually use them in constructive ways to puppet nations around the world and you can do fun things actually the one thing i will preface it it has to be expensive but i don't think you have to be a major power i think the idea you have to be a major takes some of the fun out of it if i'm iran and i want to find some diplomatic way of puppet in iraq i should be able to do that there should be set requirements to make it stop something from being op but remember guys the real reason i suggest this is because it makes spies useful and it makes the game interesting there's nothing wrong with spies at the moment i feel like they can do a lot but some of the most of the stuff they can do is not very good and then some of the stuff it can do is really good so it'd just be really nice to get that little icing on the cake and say spies are good let's reward you with better spies by allowing you to do something really cool like puppeting how cool would it be as the united kingdom to annex the raj by using spies to lower autonomy spamming spies into the Raj to lower the autonomy. That is so cool. USA would be able to cheese and sour like Belgium before Germany invade. Yeah, but how cool would that be? You have just wrote a story there. And how fun. I want to see what that story, where that story goes. Hoi 4 and EU4 and the map games by Paris are all about writing stories. And when you've got this sandbox to do really cool, interesting things, you can tell really fun stories. As you're probably guessing, guys, it's not a matter of me just wanting to add something OP to the game. It's a matter of me adding adding extra flavor to an area that maybe you feel like it's lacking. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is a suggestion, not a big one, this one, uh, but it because Hearts of Iron 4 is within a set time frame, it's actually quite difficult to get to some of the more uh, advanced technologies, rocket technology, and how it's good, but you can't really tap into its potential until later in the game. So here's my solution, guys. Jet aircraft, you know these jet aircraft? It all gets moved up one year. So 1945 becomes 1944. Once again, I understand, maybe not historical, but let's just say the player has the potential to tap into these more experimental aircraft earlier in the game so people can access them more likely. Because one of the issues with the game is you know the problem is you don't get access to these vehicles because they're too late game. So I recommend moving it from 1945 to 1944 for the first jets. And then for the later jets, move it from 1950 to 1948. Once again, this is not a big jump, by the way. This is only a very small little hippity hop. And this just lets the player experience this more advanced tech 
in the, the game's time frame. And I'm gonna say exact same for experimental rockets as well. Instead of 1943 for the first one, let's move that to 1942. And all the same for all the corresponding ones as well. Shift them up all one year. Just one year, not a massive amount. Once again, we're not breaking the game here. This is a very tiny little step forward to allow players to have this experimental aircraft earlier in the game. Because who actually makes rockets? Let's be totally fucking real. Nobody makes the rockets. And it's the same applies to rockets as well. Rocket artillery, vastly underused. Let's shift that from 1940 to 1939. And one year for all the corresponding texts as well. Why not, right? Why not? Uh, yeah, that was my suggestion. It's not a big one, really. I don't recommend you change the atomic bombs because right now I think at the moment they work just right. They're, they're a late game, end game weapon. And I think that works quite well at the moment. All right, next one. Uh, at the moment, people aren't making amphibious tanks. Okay, they're not making amphibious tanks. Uh, do you know what the solution is? Oh, an amphibious mechanized as well. Uh, do you know what the problem is? Is they're just not accessible. You have to take a detour on the focus tree. You have to go from here, then to here, then here. And this is a dead end. So my solution is you draw a line from here to here and a line from here to here. So if you have the PT-76, you can research the T-44 sequentially in a row. A bit like you see these dotted lines in the center here. So if you've got the heavy three, you can research the, the medium three from there and there. See, it basically means that amphibious tanks now are viable in the tech tree as a whole. It's not a detour away from the focus tree, uh, the tech tree. It, it keeps you on the same line, but it diverts you in a different direction. That's really it, really. Uh, the other suggestion as well is same for amphibious Amtraks. You have a line leading from these. So basically you can go amphibious one, amphibious two, and then a line leading to amphibious three. So that way you don't have to backtrack back to Amphibious 2. It just seems really stupid. And also another extra solution, instead of having the dotted line here and here too, allow you to spend XP. If I spend Naval XP on this, a bit like Doctrines, you know, like you can spend XP. If I could spend 50 Land XP and 50 Naval XP on this, I can get it twice as fast for the Amphibious Tanks and the Amphibious Amtraks as well. So you can get them quicker. It's just a solution to let you get access to these vehicles that no one uses very often a little bit faster. The biggest issue is it's a dead end, like dead end here, dead end here, but at least it gives you more accessibility and just opens it up a little bit. Oh God, this was a big one. So when you encircle something or overrun it, show a number on screen. So if you guys are already aware of uh, the next expansion that's coming out, when you encircle something, it will uh, show you a little, uh, like a helmet on screen, like exploding almost to show that something's been encircled. Where at the moment, when you encircle something, it just magically disappears. So in a kind of roundabout kind of way, they've kind of fixed this, but it doesn't show the number. It really cool if an encirclement, when it was fully closed, it give you a pop-up on screen to say how many troops you've encircled. Uh, my next solution is when you build inside resistance areas, it adds compliance. Such a simple thing. But the idea that you are investing in these areas makes these people a lot happier. So therefore, you're less likely to run into problems. I don't know. It just seems like a really, it feels like a, a small attention to detail kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like you invest in a nation, therefore they're more compliant with your occupation because you're putting money into that nation. I don't know. I just thought that was a simple thing. Another one too is when you, this is a bit of a stretch, this one, and maybe it works in, coincidingly with the operations thing. When you want to form a formable nation and you're in a faction together, you can basically click the button to form that nation regardless. I'll, I'll give a hypothetical. So for instance, you have the ability as Belgium to activate the Treaty of London, which unifies. So the idea is that if, if all three of them were in a faction together, I could hit this button and diplomatically annex them. Once again, I'm, I'm going back to the idea of diplomatically annexing something instead of having to do it by conquest. I, I know it's not historical. Don't get me wrong. I get that part. I just want a different way of being able to conquer a large amount of land. So basically it's the formable nation mechanic, but instead of having to occupy that nation, you also have the ability to have them in a faction and diplomatically annex them. That was That's kind of the idea behind it. I just like the idea, the flavor of having the ability to annex someone without it being war. All right, okay, so fallback lines. Here's my other suggestion. Do you know like when you're on the front line and you've got an offensive order, you build planning bonus? Why not have the reverse of that? When you're on a fallback line and you're sitting on it, you gain an actual bonus to maximum entrenchment. So it incentivizes you to defend. I know this is in the grand scale of things for Hearts of Iron 4, because they want to at some point incentivize defending. But the idea that you can fall back and get a bonus to entrenchment, like it almost like gives them a free engineer to be defending on 
sitting on a four bat line. The only other suggestion, which I, I, I read it and I realized after I read it, I was like, I don't really feel as connected to this anymore. Like there are decisions to do many, so, so many little things. Like you've got decisions to add extra building slots, for instance. You've got decisions to add extra resources. Why can't there be a decision like worker conditions, but something like send the men to the dockyards or something? I don't know. That's just a hypothetical. But the idea that you, you, you have something that boosts dockyard output, but reduces factory output. So the idea is you like minus 20 factory output for an extra 10% dockyard output. Something along those lines, you know what I mean? Like, why can't there be a decision to do that? I always think it's strange how some of the decisions, the generic ones are kind of like, they don't really feel like they have much flow to them. They're just kind of like, they're just random like, oh, ban fascism, ban... Pa you know, as France, it's strange to me how you can simultaneously hit the decision to ban communism but there was there's a focus called ban communism so you can ban communism twice we hate communism so much guys we're gonna ban it twice okay i'm gonna ruin your day guys yeah a lot of people like to talk about making the game more advanced and uh making it i guess in a way less accessible to new people i can guarantee you guys with how popular paradox map games have getting you'll never see a paradox game get released be significantly more advanced than the predecessor. One, because of DLC bloat. And two, they want to make it accessible to the mainstream so more people can pick this up. And to be honest with you, I'm for this. Having a game that is impossible to pick up and play is not a good idea to sell games. I want as many people to play Hearts of Iron 4 and EU4 and Hearts of Iron 6 as possible. And the idea of making it, making the barrier to entry way too freaking high is really not a good idea. So I do support their decision on that. So once again, this is something that I don't think they'll add to the game because it's too much like a national spirit. So the idea is sometimes, have you seen in some of my games, if you've watched my videos, have you watched my videos? You have the ability to cheese the civil wars sometimes to invade countries because they've got no divisions. What I would suggest to overcome my exploit, my exploit is a button that basically says, raise the militia. It's a decision called raise the militia. It costs command power, let's say 20. Uh, you lose stability, you lose political power. It, it, it can't cost political power, it just loses your political power because if it costs your political power, you'll never be able to press the button. And when you do it, you basically get eight shit four width divisions that are spawned in the capital region that spam over the front line. The situation is, is these divisions won't be very good at fighting, they'll just hold the front line for you. So therefore, it'll let the AI have the capabilities of fighting back. And it, that's as simple as it really. It's just called raise the militia, something like that. You can only fire it if your army is below a certain amount of divisions and you can only fire it if you're in a civil war. And that's it, really. It's just an ability to try and stop that cheesy play to stop people from instantly cheesing civil wars, which I am guilty of. I am guilty of. Once again, I, I, I have lots of ideas for decisions that do funky things. But the truth is, I'm very reluctant to talk about them too openly because I feel like decisions are something that PDX aren't too into anymore. Yeah, yeah, I'll be honest with you. Some of the things I've suggested are things that exist already in mods. I completely agree with that. Uh, and I probably more than likely was directly or indirectly inspired by these mods some way, shape or form. Hence the reason why I bring them up. So yeah, I'm not trying to credit the, these ideas I'm proposing as my ideas. The truth is, they are secondhand, and I have yoinked them. Yoink, 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 yoink. Okay. All right, guys. That's basically it. That's all the suggestions that I'm going to make. I'll make this as a second video on the second channel, and uh, that's basically it.